So we come from the oceans and we will talk uh, with the mountain men about uh, oceans again. So uh, I'm pleased to introduce to all of you Max here. He's, uh, he's been a friend of mine for a few years uh, and uh, actually I meet him uh, on, the, on the racing scene. Uh, he's a talented content creator, a uh, beautiful drawer, and uh, he's an amazing editor of uh, films and film maker himself. So uh, hey Max, how are you doing? I'm good, Killian. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying being back in Alaska for a little bit. Yes, and uh, actually, uh, we'll talk more about uh, the last trip you did here in Alaska. That's uh, it's been amazing. But uh, go, we, we go back a bit before. Uh, how did you start like uh, this uh, passion about outdoors? How did you, yeah, why do you love outdoors? Boy, that's a good question. Um, I think... I always grew up on the trails, which is probably a pretty common thing. And for me, content creation and outdoors, I think really started when I was bad at, at writing and reading, which, you know, I'm, you speak like 10 languages, but I can barely speak English. I'm really dyslexic, uh, which means that I struggle to kind of read and write. And so growing up, I really, really, I, I just struggled to be able to express myself and, and my passions in reading and writing. And so for me, like watercolors and film and getting outside was kind of how I was able to find that creativity and trails in the outdoors really just kind of brought that to life for me. It kind of lit that spark. And since then, it's, it's just been everything I wanted to do. That, that's, so, that's so interesting also in the way that you, you went to content creation because uh, kind of because you're dyslexia. And, and I think that's, that's uh, cool to see how Often uh, our formation is so format to do one thing in one way, and probably your uh, this lecture here has been like a, a great opportunity to to express things differently. And uh, we will go back to content creation, but uh, I think uh, what what you are doing, uh, and, and I believe that uh, content creation it's it's a great tool, uh, of course, to to present the sport. But uh, we are talking about climate here. We are talking about environment. And I believe that uh, art or uh, filming, photography is a good way to, to share the messages, to share what we feel and what we want to do about environment to, to other people. Uh, how do you think that uh, you, your work is uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, helping on that? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, it, it can feel so overwhelming. Like just climate, climate in general is just such a huge thing. And I think for a while I felt really squashed down by it, especially as a content creator. Like how do you tell a story that's as big as the entire world? And it's all connected too. And sports are an amazing way to kind of be able to narrow that world down just a little bit and make it a bit more relatable. But um, when it comes to content creation, like it really all is stories. and just because something is huge and overwhelming doesn't mean that it won't make a great story. Like the bigger, the bigger, the obstacle, the bigger the solution can be. And so from like a climate change standpoint or from a content creation standpoint, uh, we really have this amazing opportunity to tell potentially the biggest stories of our generation because we're dealing with some of the biggest obstacles of our generation. And so I did, like you mentioned, I did a lot of stories about film and kind of pushing to our limits but I really kind of stepped more into the environmental side because I, I can I can barely read a book, but I can see a movie and just like get it instantly, you know. And so for me, it's uh, I want to see those stories that kind of can visually capture these really complex, big, huge problems in a way that are understandable to someone like me. And you need content creators uh, from all over the world, all like all types of. Uh, all types of art, all types of sports, all types of angles, because it is such a huge, a huge topic talking about climate. Yeah, you you got a good point here, and I think it's our goal to with with this academy to bring science on a uh, to everyone, and and it's it's very hard to read papers, it's very hard to read the studies, and they are super cool, it's amazing, but it demands time, it demands like uh, to have a, a huge background on on science. And uh, with uh, content, with uh, showing a beautiful film, with a good message, these ideas, uh, they can go straight to, 
to our brain and, and probably it's a, it's a way that it's, we need both probably, we need the scientists to do the research and we need uh, the content creators, the divulgators to pass this message to everybody and, and that's uh, something that uh, often the two worlds are too separate and uh, what uh, what you are doing it's uh, it's a great thing to to bring that together and to to translate the scientist message the scientist uh, findings into into art into a, a piece of um, um, yeah audiovisual so it uh, it can be easily read or like uh, seen by everybody in, in their houses. But actually, when I met you for the first time, it was running in Alaska, preparing for a race. Uh, and uh, you came to this world, like, uh, I, I believe, like, uh, filming and, and uh, being more involved uh, with racing. Like, uh, you were, like, doing films and, and productions on, on racing. And uh, I hear that a few months ago, you enrolled to a trip with a boat in Alaska, uh, trying to find plastics and do research on the plastics in the ocean so how was the journey from being like filming in races towards enrolling into a scientist expedition that's a good question yeah i mean it's actually kind of funny i i went on one of these trips before i even got into filming races in fact as i filmed about marathon and then the next film i made was about these marine debris uh the issue is i never actually finished the film uh, in five years ago, I think it was for the last five, four years, I've basically been traveling around the world, filming very fast people like yourself, um, kind of the trail running scene. But before that, I actually went on one of these trips to a place called Kayak Island in Alaska, and we picked up trash for three weeks. This is an island with no people on it. Literally, no one lives there. Um, and there were millions of pounds of trash on, on this, you know, on, on Alaskan coastlines. And we were just picking up trash for days and days and days and days and days. And it had no end. And it was such a huge thing. And I felt so overwhelmed that I never made a film about it. I tried multiple times and just never could finish a film about it. And I felt really disappointed and really like kind of depressed about it, honestly. Um, Oops, art down. Uh, I felt a little depressed about it, honestly, because uh, it was just, it felt like something that needed, like, I, I just couldn't tell the story. And so for the next four years, I kind of, I worked on my art, I worked on filming, I became better at all of that. And then I finally felt ready to go back to this, uh, back to these coastlines and maybe try to make a film about this huge, huge issue that is marine debris that almost nobody knows about. Like when we think about plastic in the ocean, we think like, like this is this is a water bottle that I found um, in Kodiak, which is the the most recent um, trip. We went to Kodiak Island, uh, Alaska. Kind of looks like this. Well, this this Kodiak Island is is about right here. Uh, this it's basically Jurassic Park, but instead of dinosaurs, you have bears. Huge mountains, uh, like wide fields, beautiful nature, tons of bears, and tons of plastic. So I found this from there. This is actually from Asia. I'm not exactly sure what it says, but um, you have water, bo like water bottles, uh, trash, like here's a little buoy that we found there as well, even rubber ducks washing up from all over the world. And, and it, it's just a bizarre thing because there's almost nobody at these beaches where we're at. Uh, Katmai has, I think, 2,200 bears and no people and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of marine debris, mostly plastic, a whole lot of nets that's washing up on the ocean uh, to these shores. And, and why it's so scary and why I think I've not been able to make a film about it for so long because it's so complex is because it's kind of a ticking time bomb. And, and nobody really talks about this part, but like if you just put a, uh, I don't know, a, a glass bottle on the beach, it'll break apart. The, eventually the waves will break it into sand and you know, it'll be gone. It'll be sea glass, it'll be gone. It's not a huge deal. But when it comes to like a piece of rope maybe, so this is, this is a piece that we found, um, it frays apart and I'm not sure exactly what plastic this rope is made out of, but eventually these pieces, you can almost see it. Let's see if I can focus, there we go. You can almost see these little pieces, this rope will break into millions, millions and millions of these little pieces. And not only is that super hard to pick up, because I can, I can pick up a water bottle, that's not hard, but I can't pick up these trillions of small little pieces. But once they break up small enough, they then bioaccumulate 
and then they kind of work their way into the ecosystem in my home. And once once they're there, you really can't do anything to get out. So we kind of have this like limited time frame. There's this race to basically pick up as much of this trash as we can now before it breaks up so small that we can't pick it up. And then it breaks up so small that it gets into the environment and kind of poisons it from the inside. So at this point, we're just buying ourselves time because more and more plastic ends up on these beaches in the ocean every year. I think it's something like eight, eight million tons per year ends up in the ocean every year. Um, I should check that fact, but it's, it's a huge amount. It's mountains of trash. And, uh, and in order to have a solution, we on the land need to stop creating that disposable waste. So it's this massive, huge, big thing, but it really does come right into my backyard where you have nobody living on these beautiful, pristine beaches and these like ecosystems in Alaska, which are all connected. I'm a mountain person myself. I'm not... I'm not like a surfer, I don't go on the sea, but they're all very connected. And um, basically we kind of have this like limited window to pick up as much of this trash as we can now before it breaks down and kind of starts poisoning the landscape. Because by the time we see the effects, it's, it's gonna be too late. That's a, a great uh, point you, you bring out, uh, this connection that often when, when we talk about um, uh, waste in the nature, uh, I think it's many people that they think, yeah, it's it's for aesthetics, like it's not beautiful to see a bottle or it's not beautiful to see a piece of plastic there. But uh, we don't really understand how much when this uh, plastic, it breaks into small pieces, into microplastics that it gets into the environment. It gets to the water, it gets to the plants and it ends up to to the food chain and we are at the end of this food chain uh the most often so it gets into our body so like who is like throwing or like uh throwing plastic away we are eating this plastic us so i think even if it's in in these places in alaska it, it will end uh to the ecosystems and that's something that uh you make a good point that it's everything is connected and it's not uh this uh to to take away the plastic that is already there and to not uh throw more plastic or produce more plastic that goes uh, into the a non circular system it ends up uh poisoning the ecosystems and then poisoning ourselves so during this um during this expedition uh you were in a in a boat uh, with a different it was a a team of scientists it was a uh, clean up mission so what what were the the what was the the meaning of the of the expedition you did in uh in the island so uh we were trying to pick up a lot of marine debris and we picked up uh seven metric tons of it in about a week so we're picking up about you know two thousand that's insane <laughs> that's <laughs> and insane. That, that didn't even make a dent that's the crazy part is it's like i mean that was just like a tiny like a tiny piece of the plastics on this beach but it's important because you know you do need to remove it but not only are we removing it we're we're on a boat with all these scientists and like you said with you know with with media and people from all over the world you kind of this is a huge this is a huge issue climate is a huge issue and the solution is going to be not one single big solution. It's going to be everybody coming together. And so that's what we did on this boat. We had scientists, we had economists, we had policy professionals, um, we had public health professionals, and, and we had me as an artist. And so having all of those people in one place, we're able to kind of make those connections and be able to see, okay, this this is something that we, we can all we can all sort this out. You can't just have an engineer and figure it out. You do need everybody. And so in addition to picking up all of this, all of this marine debris, we were kind of talking what it would take to fix it. And, and like you, you made a great point. It really is. It needs to be a circle. We need plastic in this world. Like everything I'm wearing plastic. Uh, most of our, our lives wouldn't be possible without it. Um, but, and, and, you know, and like you need light plastic to make cars light. So we burn less fossil fuels and things like that. But if we're just throwing this away, it does not break down. Plastic breaks up. It will never break down. And the issue is that it, it is going to build up and we're not seeing the effects of this until later. So we were with engineers who know how to recycle it. We're talking to policy people, but um, more people need to know about this. I, I never thought I would be uh, an ocean advocate. I'm, I grew up in the mountains. I love the trails. 
but uh, but just because I'm not close to the ocean doesn't mean that it won't affect me. It's kind of like, you know, you go to the Himalayas all the time, you're really close to the atmosphere, but that doesn't mean that I don't care about the atmosphere, even though you're much closer to it than I am. It's the same with the sea. Um, the actions of people deep inland, even if you're in like the middle of a country, nowhere close to the sea, your actions could end up affecting it. And ultimately, this, what happens in the sea will affect all of us. It just might take a while. Kind of like these plastics that are washed up on the shore and are, are slowly breaking down. And so... The hope was to kind of make all these connections, get everybody together, and then start talking about how we can make these solutions. And it's a lot of work still to come. I mean, we really, we didn't figure out the solutions. We're just kind of taking those first steps. But you're right, it it will all come back to us. And like, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect the animals first. So this right here, this is one of the rubber ducks that we found. It's... Um, this is like a really famous piece of marine debris. Uh, this was from a shipping container in Hawaii that went overboard and all these rubber ducks kind of came up. Uh, there's a whole book about it. And so we found one of these. Um, Rachel found one of these on the beach 27 years later. So 27 years ago, this kind of went uh off a shipping container, basically fell off a ship. But you can see this one has a little hole in it um, where a bear bit it. So that's a that's a bear tooth mark, most likely. It could be a fox or a wolf, but probably a bear. And so one of the big issues is not only will this affect us eventually, is is that it's going to affect the ecosystems and a lot of these animals that don't necessarily know what's going on first. It's going to affect the fish, the zooplankton, um, the salmon, the bears, and then it will affect us. But if we if we work hard now, we might be able to stop it before a lot of the damage is done. And uh, I'm really excited for, like, I do a lot of painting and sketching. These are some puffins from the trip. Um, but I'm really excited to be able to kind of use art as a way to light the spark in the same way that that the outdoors and trails kind of lit the spark for me as a kid and hopefully get more people excited, passionate, because we need them to actually find the solution to this. It can't just be a couple artists. And I think that's a, that's a good uh, final point to say that it's not easy solution. I, I was going to ask you, what, what were you, the solutions that uh, that came out uh, out of the tree? But as you mentioned, it's not like just like a, a magic card that you put out and it's, uh, it's about like uh, how all together, and you mentioned it was economists, it was artists, it was scientists, it was uh, engineers. So how can all together figure out the solutions? Uh, and uh, that's uh, that's probably what we need to to do first is to be more aware. And I, I believe that the work that you are doing, uh, we are looking forward to see uh, what you have been filming there. And uh, and your your drawings uh, are very inspiring on on uh, on what you found there. To, to be aware because we are talking on an island in Alaska. It's not that it's the beach where like people are throwing the 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 rubbish, but it's far away. And I have been hearing that it's also like microplastics in, in, in the summits in Himalaya. So it's everywhere. So it's not that we throw the rubbish and it, it stays there, but it moves. It gets into the ecosystem. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good point you bring. It's we need to unite all together to find solutions and, and start working now. So thank you very much, uh, Max, for that. And uh, we keep talking. We keep talking because we need to find these solutions and and uh, and to get inspired by your work to to take more action. Awesome. Thanks, Killian. Yeah, and and I would just say, you know, um, if anybody's watching this, there there is room for you. Uh, you know, you don't have to be an engineer or a content creator. Um, I never thought that as a dyslexic painter, filmmaker about trails that I would have space, but it will take everyone. And maybe you're watching this and don't think you have a connection to it, but the the world is 70, 70 plus percent ocean and uh, and it will take everyone. And, and I really hope that, that a lot of people get excited about this because we need them. That's so cool. Yeah, everybody have a place. And even if we think that... Uh is nothing we can do we can always do things thanks max yeah thanks killian see ya